Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today we heard one of the most beloved parables of Jesus, the parable of the prodigal son. Some would like to call it the parable of the loving father, but either way, I may be telling you something about this parable that you may not know. Because it was something that I myself didn't really know about this parable for a really long time, despite having heard it many, many times. Did you know that the parable of the prodigal son is actually about table fellowship? That's really what Jesus is teaching about. Yes, you heard me correctly. It's about table fellowship. In the ancient world, it meant that you shared a high level of friendship and unity with somebody if you shared their table with them. One commentary on New Testament theology describes table fellowship in this way. It was an offer to peace, trust, brotherhood, and forgiveness. In short, sharing a table meant sharing life. In our history as God's people, this is also not uncommon. Many important events in the Old Testament are marked by God's presence at a meal. The Passover in Exodus, Many of the covenants that God makes with His people are marked by a celebratory feast afterwards. And we have, a great, of course, the great picture of the 70 elders in communion with God as they wandered in the desert. And there are many more. Yet despite all of these images and this wonderful picture we're given, we're often tempted to have our own standards for our tables that don't often follow God's standards that Jesus is teaching us about. We even sometimes seek to set new standards for His table, much less our own. And in our gospel reading today, Jesus is demonstrating the orientation of the Father against the two main ways that we're tempted to redefine our table fellowship. The first is licentiousness or reckless living, as demonstrated by the prodigal son. And the second is pride or self-righteousness, demonstrated by the elder brother. So, maybe you don't believe me yet that the parable of the prodigal son is about table fellowship. So let's look at the context in which Jesus offers this teaching. The first three chapters of, or the first three verses of chapter 15 kind of clue us in on what's going on here. That's why they're included in the gospel reading. Um, and they go like this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. But to really understand what's going on, we have to rewind it a little bit further back to the beginning of chapter 14 where you read this. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. So Jesus is at a dinner party at the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees, a big name in the religious society of Jerusalem, and they're watching him carefully because throughout Luke, the thing that sets the Pharisees off is who Jesus decides to eat with. Every time Jesus gathers these people around him and breaks bread with them, the Pharisees are upset. And again, it happens here in chapter 15. They're grumbling against what they see. Now, you may have noticed there's a little skip in the verses there. There's actually three parables on lost things, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the prodigal son or the lost son, but we're focusing on the prodigal son today, but all of this is about the Father, the Heavenly Father's table fellowship rules. So now we get back to chapter 15 and we get the start again. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus. And the Pharisees' response again is grumbling. This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. How terrible. 
what is he doing? And then the very next sentence says, so, tying those two ideas together, Jesus told them this parable. So see, it really is about table fellowship. Jesus is addressing who God wants to spend his time breaking bread with, because the Pharisees seem to have the wrong idea. So then we get to the parable itself, the prodigal son. And the first thing that's addressed is what the one danger of licentiousness or reckless living to being at the table of God. But in order to really understand the magnitude of some of the things you read in this parable, you have to kind of understand the historical context in which Jesus is, is teaching it. So the son's request is a really, really outrageous request. Because effectively what he is saying is that he wishes his father was dead so he could have the money that his father owes him when he dies. And the perception of that would have been reflected in the community. This wouldn't have just caused a rift between him and his father because no one asks for this. This is a taboo thing to do. And so any good father would reject such a request in the time and day of Jesus. And you'll see numerous times throughout this parable, the character who is unpredictable is not the sons, but the father. So the, father, or the son makes this outrageous request of his father, Father, give me the inheritance you owe me. First of all, the father doesn't owe him anything. Nor should the inheritance be given now, but the father has an equally outrageous love for his sons. And so, he honors the request. Can you imagine the shock in the community? He did what? He gave him his inheritance early. And notice that he doesn't just give the younger son his inheritance. But he provides the inheritance and he says that he divides it between them, between the younger and the older son. He gives it to both his sons. No favoritism. And then, of course, what does the son, the younger son, do with it? Well, he's got to figure out a way to liquidate his inheritance, further causing a rift between his community because nobody's going to want to be a part of that. And then he sets out and proceeds to squander all that he's been given by his father. You know the story. But I think the text specifically doesn't give us any major details about what it means when it says reckless living, because that's not the point. We don't need to know exactly what nature of this reckless living was, because when we get to the point where we see the father's love, it doesn't matter at all. But the son is reckless and licentious, and he spends all of his money unwisely and becomes poor. And not only that, but when he becomes poor, there's a famine in the land where he's staying, and he begins to starve. And so he does the one job that no good Jew would ever do. He takes care of pigs, the most unclean of unclean animals. You see, normally when you read that, you're thinking, man, he's feeding with pigs and he wants to eat the food that pigs are eating. He's at rock bottom. But consider Jesus' audience here. That's like the worst nightmare for a Pharisee. Not only is this guy feeding pigs, but he wants to eat the same food that's being given to them. It really demonstrates there's nowhere lower that he can go. And in the midst of that, the text says, he comes to himself. He realizes, what am I doing? Even the servants in my father's house, they eat regular human food. They're not starving for pig food. What the heck am I doing here? Now, we might be tempted to think that this is his repentance, his point of repentance, but it's really not. His heart has not changed. Because what follows this realization is a very human plan based on reason and logic to negotiate with his father 
a way that he can live without being shamed. Or at least he can control the level of shame he's going to experience. Some of the, comments, the commentaries I read even said that what he was trying to do was figure out a way that he could come back and be independent of his father and over time pay him back what he owed. And so even though he's come to himself and he's returning home, he doesn't yet understand what's going to happen when he gets there. He doesn't yet understand the reason for the suffering and what God is calling him to come back to. And so he returns, speech in hand, ready to negotiate, and totally unexpectedly, while he's still a long way off, the father of the house his son, who's been rejected by their community, has formed a rift between the two of them. He sees him while he's a long way off, and he takes off running. And he wraps him in his arms and weeps upon his neck. And notice, he does all that before any speeches are made. Before anything can be said about this plan and this negotiation for the son, and then after he experiences the unbelievable love of his father, all he can get out is the real repentance statement. It says this in verse 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Full stop. No rationalizations, no negotiation. In the experience of the love of the Father, he realizes and comes to real repentance. There is no negotiating. I am unworthy, period. Dear friends in Christ, this is what you and I say when we confess our sins. But if we're honest, sometimes we come like the prodigal son with a little bit of negotiations. We think, well, you know, I know I've ruined my shot at this, but I still have this on the table. And when you hear your forgiveness pronounced, when you experience the gospel, when you hear the truth of the way God feels about you, like you heard it when we read this parable today, all that you can utter is, I have sinned against you, I am unworthy. Full stop. But this parable isn't about the son. It's about the father's response to the son, the father's solution to these two ways which we want to break apart the table fellowship that God intends. And so what's the father's solution to the son who has squandered everything in licentious and reckless living? It is the gospel love that we experience in Jesus. It is him running out there, hugging us, weeping on our neck, and throwing a great big party for our return, never once considering us anything other than his child. We're the only one who thinks that. And then he sets the record straight with Jesus. Unconditional love that invites the repentance of sins. This is the Father's solution to the reckless son. So, dear friends in Christ, hear Jesus' teaching here. The Father still views you as His beloved child, even when you live recklessly, even when you squander the gifts that He's given you, even when you don't use them to serve Him, but rather to serve yourself and your own interests. You may come to yourself and come back to Him, come back to the church and have a plan and an idea, but when you get here, I can guarantee you what you're going to hear is the unconditional love that God has for you. It blows apart all those plans because it's better than you can even imagine. Can you imagine what the son is feeling when he experiences the joy of his father, whom he's dreaded? I mean, I don't know about you guys, I've had to make that journey back to my earthly dad knowing that I know He knows the thing that I did. And let me tell you, you're not expecting much joy. And if you've been there yourself, you know. But then in those moments 
when you experience the love of your earthly father, if you are blessed with that. It's a reflection of this love. And if you're one of those who wasn't blessed with that, you do have the heavenly father, the perfect father, and this is the love he has for you. Now the second danger to God's table fellowship. The proud older son, his danger isn't that he left the home and squandered his inheritance, but that by participating and doing the things that he's supposed to do, he has now become prideful and self-righteous and no longer wants to associate with those tax collectors and sinners. Who do you think this one's directed at when Jesus is talking? Sitting at a dinner table with one of the rulers of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are grumbling that all of these deplorable people are surrounding Jesus. I'll give you one guess. The Pharisees. Remember that grumbling? I'll repeat it once again. This man receives sinners and eats with them. That is the older brother if anything is. So remember back to the beginning of the parable, the older brother receives the same outrageous love from his father, right? When the, when the younger brother requests his inheritance, it says that he offers the whole inheritance and divides it between his two sons. And in the ancient world, the older brother gets even more. The older brother gets two-thirds and the younger brother gets one. So the older brother, the good, steadfast, obedient older brother is out in the fields working when all of a sudden he starts to hear music, singing, shouting, shouts of joy. And as he's coming back in from his work, he's wondering, what the heck is going on? And so he calls one of the servants to him and, and says, what's all the commotion about? And what is he told? He's told the joyous news. Your brother has returned, and your father has killed the fattened calf and is throwing a huge party to celebrate because he has him back safe and sound. That's what this servant says. And just a little aside here, when you throw a party and you slay the fattened calf, that's not just a small family party. I don't know about you guys, but my family can't eat a whole fattened calf. That signifies that this was a party that he was throwing for the community. Because remember, when the younger son made the outrageous request, he didn't just create a rift between himself and the father, but he was rejecting the rules of the community he was a part of. And so it, when the father throws this great party for him, he's not only reconciling the son to himself, but to the community of his household, demonstrating that invitation of brotherhood and unity and forgiveness, not just between the two, but the whole group. And so this is great news. Your brother has returned. But how does the older brother respond to this news? This joyous news, his reaction is anger and bitterness. And the result of that action is that he refuses to participate in the table fellowship of the Father. He refuses to go in and be a part of the celebration of the return to life of the younger brother. And his refusal is a demand, it's an implicit demand that his father better come and find him and set the record straight. You ever given somebody the silent treatment? When you give somebody the silent treatment, what are you expecting them to do? You're expecting them to come crawling on their knees, apologizing, wanting you back. And if you didn't do anything wrong, what's the human reaction to that? <laughs> no way, man. I'm not going to do that. You're the one in the wrong here. But again, the father displays his outrageous love for his sons. Even though his older son doesn't deserve the time of day, 
Listen to the language that is used here about the father. It says in verse 28, his father came out. So the father comes out of the party to his older son and entreats him. And some translations say pleads with him. That's unbelievable. The father is coming out to the son. He's leaving the party, coming to the son, and pleading with his son. This son of his who doesn't deserve the time of day. And even that, the older son refuses. He refuses the entreaty of his father. And he doesn't just refuse it, but then he begins to berate and yell at his father in public. Now remember, who's gathered at this party. This isn't just some family squabble. He's now yelling at his father before all of the gathered guests. An extremely rude thing to do. And notice that his accusations reflect his behavior. Remember that the text didn't really give us any specifics about the reckless living of the younger son, but the older son seems to think he knows what was going on, despite the fact that he does not. And so he definitely breaks the eighth, eighth commandment here. He insists that he knows that, well, this son of yours who went off, he squandered the money on prostitutes. An angry judgment when he clearly has not spoken with the younger brother about any of this, the story of his experience, but making the assumption. So what is the father's solution again for this danger of refusing to be a part of the table fellowship he has so graciously and lovingly prepared for his sons? His outrageous love again. He says, what is mine is yours. All that I have belongs to you. But we should also rejoice for your brother who was dead and is now alive. In other words, what does that have to do with anything? The news that I'm giving you is that your brother who ran away, who we thought was dead, is back and is alive. That's why we're celebrating. And the self-righteous brother can only think about who? Himself. And I think Jesus purposely leaves the answer hanging at the end of the parable about whether or not the older son ever goes into the party. Remember, consider his audience. He's talking to the Pharisees. What is Jesus' desire for the Pharisees? That they repent of their pride and their self-righteousness and join the party. Come to my table, Jesus says. And some do, and some didn't. Just as today, some do, and some don't. We're often like the older brother as well, before you get too judgmental about the Pharisees. Thinking we're better than other people, now, I'm not the best person, but I'm not that guy. Too good to associate with certain individuals, the unclean, the deplorable, the person who opposes me about politics, about moral issues. I've got no time for them. I'm going to grumble that God seems to. Don't we? Don't believe me? Well, what thoughts enter into your mind when you encounter those who are shunned by your self-righteousness? Do you invite them into your home to break bread at your table? That's what Jesus is asking us to do. That's what Jesus is teaching us that the Father does. Jesus directed this part at the Pharisees because they aren't the, but they aren't the only ones who need to hear it. So, what does this mean for you today, sitting in that pew in 2022? Well, it teaches us a few things. One is, I don't know about you, 
But now I'm thinking about my table a bit differently. But the primary lesson here is the Father's outrageous love. Because the Father is the one defining what the table fellowship rules are. This is what Jesus is teaching those who are listening. Which is a great comfort to you and I. Because we wander out into reckless living, don't we? Take what God has given us and squander it. And what Jesus is teaching us here is that when you do that and you return to yourself, even if you haven't quite fully understood the purpose of your turning back to your God, when you get there, He'll remind you why. He'll set the record straight. He'll clean you up. He doesn't wait for you to do that yourself. And the second thing it should teach us is that repentance is something that happens through exposure to the love of God. It's not a work that we do within ourselves. It's not an aha moment where we realize the real state of things. It's a response to hearing the gospel. So what does that mean for us? That means then we should be around other Christians a lot so they can remind us of that truth and that we should regularly hear God's Word so that we can be reminded of that love. And then instead of negotiating with God, we are freed just to confess and receive His forgiveness. The third thing we learn is there's a little warning here that you can separate yourself in both those ways from God's table. Whether it's through self-righteousness and pride or licentiousness or reckless living. Both can draw you away from where God wishes you to be with Himself at His table. Having a party with Him And I think the last thing it teaches us is that it sets us free from thinking that we can negotiate our place at the table. This table is an invite only. An invitation from the Father is required. And even when the, the prodigal son comes to himself and returns, he doesn't fully get it until his father rushes out, wraps him in his arms, and weeps on his neck in joy. For my son who is dead is now alive. Dear friends in Christ, that is how God in Jesus feels about you. Return to him. Hear about his wondrous love. And come to his table. In the name of Jesus. Amen.